Right, so this is my attempt at um, describing the environment of higher education in recent years. So you're going to have to forgive me whilst I uh, draw my cartoons. But the first issue we're going to talk about is massification. And um, this is the bringing of education to the masses. Um, some of the statistics in the book. Let me just get my notes back up again. Because I can't draw... Um, at the same time in the 90s um, higher education was ex accessed by about 15% of the population in some countries and in the UK it's up to about 40% now so a real change a shift from um, one set of students who uh, went to university because they were the very brightest of the bunch and it was seen as the thing that they're only the very brightest of the bunch academically by the way I'm not talking about real world schools or those things that we also value now but in terms of academia those very high achieving academically oriented students were the ones that um, populated universities in ye oldie days which weren't that so long ago and now what we have is the issue of diversification which comes from Massification, don't you just love these words? And with diversification, what we end up with is Susan, who is a very keen and very bright and very well motivated student who can apply learning herself. And actually, she comes to university to learn some new stuff and get her degree. But actually, in class, Susan is almost able to teach herself. She's very fertile soil and so is. Um, a joy to lecturers generally speaking but sitting alongside Susan these days more and more often is Robert now Robert is at university because he wants a better job or he knows that university is the way to achieve certain things in life he was never particularly academically motivated but knew how to play the game so he got the grades to get here um, he knows that there is a value in passing a degree but actually doesn't study particularly for the love of studying. It's the end result that Robert is interested in. And so we have this range of motivations in the classroom. And what we also have, as a consequence of that, is a broader range of abilities. And what all of this leads to down here is different levels of student engagement like the engagement ring and so we have the conundrum of how to engage both Robert and Susan in the classroom on top of that we have the pressures of industry um, there are more and more vocational courses in universities now. There are more and more drivers um, from outside of academia uh, into what the world wants from its universities. And some of the things they say are, we want work-ready students. Yeah, and so universities like Harper Adams, REA, <coughs> um, Universities like Harper Adams and many others place big emphasis on sandwich courses and vocational qualifications because those are the things that industry rewards us for churning out. And so they'll give us more grant money, they'll support us better, they'll provide us with all kinds of things to help us um, on the basis that we provide the kinds of students they're likely to need in industry. Okay, so that's the kind of background, some of the stuff that's going on. Um, that was formalised in a place called Bologna, where the Bologna Agreement was uh, written and ratified within Europe. And that was all about, as well as those things we were talking about here, things like mobility of students. Um, one of the principles of European law is the freedoms of Europe and one of those freedoms is for students to be able to move between universities. Another one of the pressures on Bologna in, when they were thinking about their agreement was preparation for active lives. Europe as an economy will succeed much 
in a much better way if our students and our pupils are motivated and prepared for active working lives which contribute towards the economy of Europe. So, out of Bologna came frameworks, frameworks for, in, for um, educational uh, achievement, for measuring how well universities compare against each other, for making sure that um, mobility of students is possible because uh, students can move between universities. And another byproduct of this was a change in funding structures, uh, which has been, again, um, added to lately by the kind of increased fee rates that students face. It doesn't mean that there's um, a difference in terms of the funding that the university gets as a whole. In fact, they more often than not end up with less funding this way. But students are paying much more than £9,000 student fee that we all hear about in place this year. It means that there's this additional pressure going this way of changing perceptions within the student body about what they want, the student as customer. Now I'm not sure that's really what's happening, but there is this perception within industry, that, that um, within academia, that students are going to behave much more like customers, now that they're asking much more, uh, being asked to pay much more towards their degree. But we can only see if that's actually what happens as they move through their degrees. So to go back to frameworks over here, um, part of the Bologna arrangement was all about um, making it make, making skills transferable so that students were mobile and so we ended up with something called outcome based teaching and learning and this isn't just in the higher education sector this is happening across the education sector generally and that kind of measuring things by outcome is a way to ensure quality all right, so equitable quality between institutions, between degrees, on all those kinds of issues. And so as a consequence of that, we have a body called the QAA, whose job it is is to make sure that happens. But on top of that, as well as measuring ourselves as academic institutions against the, the um, remit of the QAA, we also, because of league tables and wanting to gain lots of the right kinds of students and lots of Susans, um, and the right kinds of Roberts, we also spend lots of time concentrating on this, which is a national student survey, which is what our students say about us in their final year at uni. And the trouble with the NSS, the student survey is, um, if they had a, a rotten um, subject in the last term and it was really difficult, or if, as in the case of Hobbratons, we changed the parking arrangements so they're no longer allowed to park their cars quite so close to campus. All those things can impact upon a student's satisfaction um, of their time at university. And actually very few of them are actually within the control of this guy or lady here. And this is your lecturer. Okay? And what we know about our lecturers are that for the most part they love teaching and they definitely, definitely love their subject. And they also, generally speaking, were those Susans at university who love to study because they still do it now. And so you quite often hear things that refrain around the I can relate to Susan, but Robert puzzles me. And these are the kinds of conversations that sometimes happen in the staff room. Um, I've certainly overheard lots of them. Okay, and also if, if we're talking about um, uh, motivations and things that worry us, there's also this kind of amongst our senior uh, colleagues about why did it all have to change. Because, you know, we were educating the brilliant minds of our students 30, 40 years ago without all these kinds of pressures. So that's what this poor guy here is sitting with, looking very worried or bothered or harassed or whatever and then there's this one 
last pressure which is this one here of industry coming down and informing the Bologna process and creating another pressure which is that industry wants to have a say in our higher education environment and so that's my brief summary of the drivers and the issues around the massification of higher education. Thank you.